dramatic scenes in Spain as hundreds of African migrants storm a border fence and how two Oscar-nominated documentaries are highlighting the plight of refugees. U.S. President Donald Trump holds his first solo press conference after a tumultuous week in the White House. And from Cape to Rio, two South African rowers embark on a record-breaking journey with two goals in mind. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories in a moment, uh, but first, seven suspected Boko Haram militants are dead on Friday, having blown themselves up in northeastern Nigeria. Witnesses say the tourists attack targeted refugees preparing to return to their home villages on the outskirts of Maiduguri. Maiduguri is at the heart of a government campaign to eradicate Boko Haram, whose more than seven-year insurgency has killed 15,000 people and forced some two million from their homes. The Bono State Emergency Management Agency says that eight members of a local militia, the Civilian Joint Task Force, were wounded in the attack, which underscores Boko Haram's ability to operate in the region, despite Nigeria's insistence that it has crushed the group. Now, European countries are continuing to struggle with arriving migrants. Early Friday, some 500 migrants from the sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa crossed the fenced border surrounding Spain's North African enclave of Shuta from Morocco. That's according to Red Cross Emergency Services. Dozens of migrants, many with wounds from climbing over the six-meter barbed wire fence, celebrated in the streets with some shouting freedom. The Red Cross says it was treating some 400 migrants at its center there. Spain's two enclaves in Morocco, Shuta and Melilla, are often used as entry points into Europe from African migrant, for African migrants who either climb over the border fences or try to swim along the coast. In January, more than 1,000 migrants tried to cross into Shuta, but most were eventually turned back. UN peacekeeping uh, chief have Latsos has told the Security Council uh, the new upsurge of violence in the Central African Republic has forced some 100,000 people to flee their homes and now half of the population needs humanitarian assistance. Latsos says despite the improving security situation in the capital Bangui, security concerns remain in other parts of the country underlying the need for continued international attention. Human Rights Watch said Thursday that rebels in CRR killed at least 32 civilians after clashes with the rival armed group. Latsu says that the violence between the Popular Front for the Renaissance of CRR and the Union for Peace in the Central African Republic fighters in the country's central region had assumed ethnic overtones and that this was particularly worrying. In Bangui, we can say it's relatively calm. By contrast, our violence are connected to transhumanism in the northwest of the country continues. Generally, these are peaceful movements of millions of cattle escorted by its shepherds. Nevertheless, there is a problem of clashes between ex seleka or Popular Front for the Resistance of Central African Republic, and the Union for Peace in Central African Republic. And this continues to threaten the central region. These clashes also carry a disturbing ethnic connotation. Well, despite successful elections last year that was seen as a step toward reconciliation after years of civil conflict, the government and a 13,000 strong UN peacekeeping mission are struggling to contain violence by rainbow groups. What well, tropical storm Dino has wreaked havoc on the eastern coast of Mozambique since Wednesday, killing seven people. That's according to the nation's disaster center. Heavy rains have pounded the area with winds of up to 160 kilometers an hour, raising the risk of flooding and crop damage in the impoverished uh, South and African country. Uh, now, Mozambique's emergency operational center says about 130,000 people living in the Inahambane province, 500 kilometers north of the capital Maputo, have been affected by the storm. About 20,000 homes have been destroyed. Mozambique is prone to flooding, and it's especially vulnerable after year, uh, last year's major drought. Soil degraded or hardened by dry spells does not easily absorb water. Well, the press conferences of U.S. President Donald Trump have become must-see TV for their drama on the unexpected. In recent days, the president has endured the withdrawal of one of his cabinet nominees and the forced resignation of his national security advisor. 
And media reports citing intelligence sources continue to link his campaign officials to Russia. During Thursday's White House news conference, Mr. Trump's defend, Mr. Trump defended his administration and again lashed out at the media. The viewers Bill Gallo reports. It was an unprecedented back and forth between a U.S. president and the reporters who cover him. Donald Trump began by naming a replacement for a cabinet choice who withdrew because of opposition within his own Republican Party. The nominee for secretary of the Department of Labor will be Mr. Alex Acosta. Touted his accomplishments so far. We have made incredible progress. I don't think there's ever been a president elected who in this short period of time has done what we've done. And delivered a constant barrage of criticism for the media. The press honestly is out of control. The level of dishonesty is out of control. That was just in the first five minutes of the 77 he spent with the media. Trump was asked repeatedly about reports that his campaign advisors were in regular contact with Russia. I have nothing to do with Russia. I told you. I have no deals there. I have no anything. Russia is fake news. Russia, this is fake news put out by the media. And he said it could hurt any relationship he might develop with Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's sitting behind his desk and he's saying, you know, I see what's going on in the United States. They follow it closely. It's going to be impossible for President Trump to ever get along with Russia because of all the pressure he's got with this fake story. While defending the rollout of the ban on immigration that has been held up by the courts, Trump announced he would try again. We're issuing a new executive action next week that will comprehensively protect our country. Interspersed in his statement and his responses to questions, Trump had plenty of feedback for the reporters about how they're covering him in his new administration. It's all fake news. It's all fake news. The failing New York Times. I just see many, many untruthful things. Trump's assessment of the situation he and the country face is dire. To be honest, I inherited a mess. It's a mess. At home and abroad, a mess. Despite that and the setbacks he's already encountered, Trump says he is optimistic for the moment. This administration is running like a fine-tuned machine. Bill Gallo, VOA News, the White House. Well, Russia is re has reacted defensively and cautiously after the ouster of Michael Flynn, considered among the most uh, Kremlin-friendly people in the new administration. Now, President Trump's tougher stance on Crimea this week also ruffled feathers in Russia. VOA's Moscow correspondent Daniel Sheff reports. Trump, Trump, it is Trump. Russia's initial euphoria when President Trump took office is fading after Flynn's resignation and Trump's call for Russia to return Crimea to Ukraine. Russia considered Flynn key to promoting improved relations with the United States. I think that it uh, worries Russian lawmakers and Russian policymakers because he has been considered to be one of very few pro-Russian uh, American politicians. While the Kremlin called Flynn's resignation a U.S. internal matter, Russian lawmakers described it as politically motivated against Russia. Yes, Flynn wrote in his report that he did not tell the president about his contacts with the leadership of the Russian embassy in the USA, but this may be some sort of political and informational action which was prepared in advance. Officials bluntly dismissed the Trump White House calling on Russia for the first time to de-escalate violence in Ukraine and return the Crimean Peninsula that was annexed in 2014. We do not give back our own territory. Crimea is territory belonging to the Russian Federation. That is it. U.S. lawmakers critical of Trump are not taking any chances. They introduced a bill to block the president from lifting sanctions against Russia over Ukraine without congressional approval. A Kremlin spokesman denied a New York Times report of contacts between Trump's presidential campaign and Russian intelligence agents, which Trump also dismissed as nonsense. This is purely a newspaper report which is not based on any facts and which does not point to any real facts. Some are calling for a deeper inquiry into White House ties to Russia. Russians are still hopeful that relations with the United States will improve under Trump, but also increasingly cautious as the controversy and political turmoil play out.
We do not know what line he will choose, but the Crimea is Russian for sure. I do not know how he will carry on, but I hope for the better. I hope that we will have good relations with America. Adding to tensions are allegations the Kremlin violated a missile treaty with the United States, positioned spy ships off its east coast, and had Russian jets buzz a U.S. Navy ship in the Black Sea. The Kremlin dismissed the allegations, and President Trump made no immediate comment. Daniel Scherf, VOA News, Moscow. Vice Admiral Robert Howard has turned down the offer by President Donald Trump to become the new National Security Advisor, replacing Michael Flynn, who was forced out earlier this week. The 60-year-old Howard, who is a former Navy SEAL and speaks fluent Farsi, retired from the military in 2013. He's currently working as an executive at Lockheed Martin, the weapons and aerospace company where he focuses on the United Arab Emirates. Howard is well respected in the national security community and he has close ties with Defense Secretary Jim Mattis. Howard has previous experience serving in the White House, having worked in the National Security Council and uh, former President George W. Bush. Howard says the National Security Advisor Post requires 24 hours a day, seven days a week focus and commitment to do it right and that he could not make that commitment at this time. While well, immigrants in the United States have had a bad rap through a divisive presidential election. Now, with a new administration in the White House, there seems to be real consequences, ranging from travel bans to deportations. But immigrants are fighting back, and on Thursday in Washington, some businesses gladly suffered the loss of a day without their workforce. VOA's Arash Arabasadi explains. Across the country, many American businesses closed Thursday. It's eerily quiet today because it's a day without immigrants. No immigrants means no immigrant labor. It happened so quickly. It was like a, a little spark that just ignited a fire that was waiting to be lit. It's part of a nationwide strike, raising awareness of the contribution immigrants make in the United States. We simply could not operate, nor would we want to, without our Hispanic and immigrant staff. It really would bring not only the restaurant industry, but I think many, many industries to a screeching halt. So a lot of workers stayed home and businesses shuttered their doors. We would not be able to exist without them. And I dare say, uh, I can't think of any restaurant in the city that would be able to. We have to stop thinking of immigrants as just uh, pawns in a bigger picture for political gain. We have to think of them as human beings like all of us are. One day closed costs just these two small business owners tens of thousands of dollars, earnings they say they're willing to lose to shine a light on the impact of immigrants in America. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. Well, our two documentaries on the plight of refugees off the Italian coast and the Greek coast, respectively, have received Oscar nominations. Fire at Sea by Gianfranco Rossi has been selected in the feature documentary category, and 4.1 Miles by Daphne Mazziarraki has been nominated in the short documentary category. Viewers Penola Pipulo spoke with Rossi about his film and about how these documentaries help bring public awareness to the refugee crisis in a tough political climate. Lampedusa. Over the past 20 years, the tiny Italian island, 120 kilometers off the Sicilian coast and 70 kilometers off the coast of Tunisia, has become a gateway to Europe for close to half a million refugees. Your position, please. Your position. Please, can you help us okay. very quickly? How many people? 150 people. We have a small children. Please, can you help us? We are staying here. In Through his cinematic masterpiece, Oscar-nominated Gianfranco Rossi conveys two different worlds inhabiting the tiny island. The quiet, unassuming islanders and the incoming migrants. These two communities, the islanders and the migrants, they never meet. So Lampedusa became almost like a metaphor of what's happening in the world. You know, these uh, two forces that they barely touch each other and they never meet. Rossi's documentary introduces a few islanders. Each one reflects the human condition in the middle of a world humanitarian crisis. He centers his film on Samuele, a Sicilian boy living on the island. 
Rossi likens his exuberance, roughhousing, as well as his tenacity and introspection to a humanity that has not yet reached maturity. The anxiety of Samuel is our own anxiety. The, um, the wonder of Samuel is our own wandering. The lazy eye of Samuel is our lazy eye. On the other end of the specter is Dr. Bartolo. As the only physician on the island, he examines every single refugee coming to Lampedusa and confirms the dead. Bartolo is the voice of reason and compassion. Tutto questo ti lascia tanta rabbia, ti lascia un, un vuoto nello stomaco, un buco. The refugee crisis is also at the center of Daphne Maciaraki's short documentary, 4.1 Miles. The film, which also received an Oscar nomination, chronicles around the clock rescue missions off the Greek island of Lesbos. Coast Guard Kyriakos, the main character in the story, says that he and his team are called to rescue 200 people per hour. <laughs> According to the film, between 2015 and 2016, 600,000 migrants crossed six and a half kilometers of water, that is 4.1 miles, between Turkey and Lesbos. I was proposing Lampedusa and Lesbos for the Nobel Prize, you know, these two special islands in the middle of nowhere that uh, they welcome uh, migrants from all over the world. Rossi hopes his film helps bring awareness about the refugees' ordeal. It's like in this moment, you know, when people say, what can I do now? Where, where, where do I stand? Which one is my position? Your position. My friend. Hello. Hello. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. And also check us out, uh, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, Kenya's uh, Safari.com aims for its share of the online video streaming market. Stay with us. Every song has a different meaning to each person that hears it and interprets it differently. Border Crossing is unique in that it lets the listeners decide what we're playing. But we bring in guests so that our audience has access to some of the biggest names in pop music today. And uh, we reach out to the audience each and every day in different ways. Wallet Friday's business report, U.S. stocks have had another record-breaking week as global equities have jumped trillions of dollars following the election of President Donald Trump. With more details, here is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting from the Nasdaq market side in New York. U.S. stocks open lower as financials and energy lag and consumer staples lead the way. Now, coming into today's session, the S&P 500 has gone 88 trading days without a 1% decline, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average has closed at all-time highs six days in a row. The Nasdaq has not gone back-to-back -back days down in 2017. Now, with that, global stocks have jumped in value by more than $5 trillion since President Trump's November victory as investors focus on market-friendly policies. Now, this stat is according to Bloomberg. Turning to the week ahead, U.S. markets will be closed on Monday in observance of President's Day. And while it is a holiday shortened week, the earnings calendar is still busy with a focus on the retailers as well as large cap tech names HPQ. Recall Cisco and IBM printed solid quarters as these legacy tech companies 
right size their business lines. Other hot stocks to watch include Home Depot, Macy's, Tesla, and Nordstrom, which has certainly been in the news as it has been on the business end of one of President Trump's tweets. Outside of earnings, there's a number of housing data on tap and a handful of Federal Reserve speakers will be on the circuit. And of course, traders will continue to be focused on the Trump trade and macro themes such as the lack of volatility and policy changes. From the NASDAQ market site in New York, I'm Jill Malandrino, and this is Africa 54 Business News. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jill. Now, Kenyan telecom giant Safaricom wants to meet the growing demand for internet connections and online streaming services. Until recently, the company had been focusing on mobile money, but now things are changing. Africa 54's Paul Ndiho explains. When the name Safaricom is mentioned, many Africans immediately think of mobile money. Kenya's are most successful innovative mobile money phone transfer technology called M-Pesa. This technology is transforming the lives of millions of people and it has made paying for services and merchandise through your mobile phone very easy. To compete as an industry leader on the continent, Safaricom is reallocating funds to build up its fixed data network to connect uh, homes uh, to the internet as demand for online streaming services like Netflix uh, grows. Chief Executive Officer Bob Collimore. We've been a bit lazy in growing our data business. Um, you know, the half year we showed that it was uh, something like 40-ish, 43% growth, I think. Uh, if you look across the continent, that's a little bit, we're a little bit of laggards. The continent growth on data has probably been closer to 51%, 52%. Across the world, it's more like 60, 62%. Uh, so I think we can do better in this space. Collymore says their investment in the fixed data network is a reallocation of its budget and it will not add to its planned expenditures. People want to have ideally unlimited data. Unlimited data on, on mobile, um, is not economically viable right, in the long term. Um, so we're using fixed to give you the data access in the home and then when you're roaming. Safaricom has already connected nearly 6,000 homes to its new fixed data network using underground fiber lines and the more traditional overhead data poles. He says the move was driven by the growing local demand to download or stream content such as a Netflix science fiction drama Sense8, which has some scenes shot in Kenya. To recruit new customers in Kenya, Safaricom has also partnered with Showmax, an internet-based video streaming service owned by South Africa's Nespers, a broadband-based multinational internet and media group headquartered in Cape Town, South Africa. People don't want to just um, have access to the internet. They're also going to want to be downloading content. And if you're downloading content, you're down downloading movies, even short clips on mobile data, it's going to be relatively expensive. We're kind of pretty close to our cost base on, um, on our price of data. Uh, so we can't really go much lower than that at the moment. Over time, it might come down. Um, so we want to give people a solution that they can use um, you know, you can access a Netflix movie or a Showmax movie. Kenya is among the 130 countries that can now access internet streaming services from Netflix. Safaricom hopes to bank on the success of its mobile money transfer technology to tap into the growing demand for online streaming services. Economic analysts say some of the factors behind Safaricom's success cannot be copied but others can, possibly allowing for other African companies and countries to follow Kenya's pioneering internet building example. Safaricom has already spent $25 million on a license for the fourth generation of 4G network that has been rolled out in Kenya's major urban centers. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, from Cape to Rio. Why two South African rowers are taking on this South Atlantic. We'll be right back.
Earlier this month, two South African rowers pushed off from the coast of Cape Town and began what they hope would be a record-breaking journey across the Southern Atlantic to Rio de Janeiro. Their goal is to raise awareness about climate change. Robert Carmichael has the story. Meet 59-year-old Cape Tonian Bram Malherba, an extreme athlete and conservationist. In the past decade, Malherba has run the 4,500-kilometer-long Great Wall of China, raced on foot to the South Pole in temperatures of 45 Celsius below zero, and run along the several thousand-kilometer-long Southern African coastline to fund cleft palate operations for children. His toughest challenge yet is to row across the Southern Atlantic in this 6.8-meter-long carbon fiber and fiberglass craft called the Mondoro, which means spirit of the lion. Mulherber says he and rowing companion Wayne Robertson will take turns on deck. So it's rowing two hours, resting two hours, 24-7, through the day, through the night, for up to 90 days. We are hoping that we're going to have tailwinds, which means we could possibly compete it in as, as little as 60 days. The boat is fitted with solar power, communications equipment, a desalinator, and it's packed with dehydrated food. They can rest, too, in the watertight dome, which doubles as their shelter during storms. But there are bigger dangers than bad weather. Greatest dangers, ships at night. We have what's called an AIS on, on the vessel, um, line of sight. So we'll pick up a vessel and it'll go beep, beep, beep and send an alarm. But they, they don't change course and sometimes there's not even anyone on the bridge. So being hit by a ship is, it's over for us. Rio is about 6,000 kilometers as the crow flies. Reaching it will require more than 2 million pulls of the oars. So we'll follow the Benguela current, which goes up the west coast of Africa, uh, past Namibia, uh, Angola, and we turn in. The currents will move inward this way, north of the high pressure system, just south of the island of St. Helena, and then we'll come down. The goal is to raise awareness for the DOT challenge which stands for Do One Thing for the Planet. The free app encourages people to take action, to preserve the environment and to share what they've done. The two men left Cape Town on February 7th. Their goal is to engage one dot follower for every pull of the oar. Robert Carmichael for VOA News, Cape Town. We wish them success. And that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News tonight at 18 under UTC and in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us here in Washington. Have a good night. to the Voice of America's News Words. The U.S. economy has had its ups and downs. Recently, the chairman of the Federal Reserve described it this way. Resilient. Despite persistently low energy prices and economic weakness abroad, Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says the U.S. economy has been resilient in the face of shocks. Resilient means being able to recover from difficult conditions and unexpected changes. The chairman of the Federal Reserve says the U.S. economy is resilient because it is slowly getting better after the Great Recession, which began 
in 2008.